Forget about everything that you, that all the intricacies of Bitcoin and how amazing blockchain is, fine, whatever. But like you go back to the foundation, it just doesn't make sense. And, and that's <laughs> the, but the people that think and they're like, okay, well, we do have to progress from first principles and then build up. But then the other people are like, well, what if, what if we're thinking about it wrong? What if there's a step wrong in the logic and we can't, we just can't see it. And, and, you know, you have this whole thing, Bitcoin, and it's here at the right time. So like, why am I going to be, distracted with petty logic which might have something wrong in the in the system that i can't see because you know am i going to trust my mind that deeply no i'm going to trust this blockchain thing that's like so magnificent that that makes more sense and then we're like no no no, the logic's right and then like okay fine but i'll deal with that later yeah you'll deal with it when it crashes and you'll hopefully come back and join us rafi faba delves into the complexities of leadership and societal change particularly highlighting the difficulties in understanding and addressing the systemic issues plaguing modern societies. Faber explores the inherent human tendencies shaped by evolutionary history and how they impact our ability to lead and make informed decisions. Faber begins by discussing the fundamental nature of human social structures, tracing our behavior back to our evolutionary past. He notes that, much like apes, human societies are often structured around dominant figures alphas who lead while others follow. This hierarchical nature, ingrained in us through evolution, reflects a broader truth about human behavior and governance. He suggests that while humans possess the capacity for higher reasoning and a fleeting ability to view the world from a broader perspective akin to having the image of God, this perspective is often short-lived. Despite our intellectual potential, we frequently become absorbed in the immediate concerns of daily survival, which limits our capacity for long-term, objective analysis, Faber emphasizes the difficulty in achieving true intellectual candor. He acknowledges that while humans strive to be objective, our understanding is inherently limited by personal biases and perspectives. This challenge is evident in the way people process and remember significant events, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Faber recounts how some people have forgotten or minimized the impact of pandemic-related measures, like vaccine mandates, demonstrating a collective amnesia about past crises. Faber underscores the difficulty in leading or influencing societal change. He argues that while some people are able to critically analyze and challenge prevailing narratives, many others simply follow along without questioning the status quo. This dynamic creates a divide between those who seek to understand and address systemic issues and those who remain passive or uninformed. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview. But first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. Why can't, why can't they figure it out? Well, if they could, everyone would be a leader and you wouldn't need government. Really, yeah. what, what, you, what you have in, in, in humans, and I think this comes from our evolution from apes, like there's, a, there's an alpha and there are followers. And that's just, that's how ape society is structured. And that's how, how we're structured. And yeah, we, ha we have, uh, you know, a Salem Elohim, we have the image of God in us. Um, which means like for a brief moment, we can separate from physical reality and take a bird's eye view of the world and of society and try to see from above it as to what's really going on. But then we quickly get like sucked down back into, you know, working the land and sweating our brow and, and, and doing what we have to do to survive. Um, so, I mean, the, not many people can, can zoom out and look at what's happening from above with intellectual candor. Even we, we were not completely intellectually honest with ourselves we can't be we can only be to a certain degree and we're going to get a lot of things wrong and we're going to be biased on our own ways of looking at things and uh you know people are going to find different people and then hopefully synthesize but yeah like you know we were i was talking about this with my wife there's in during during the whole covid fiasco whatever the hell that was there were people that saw what was going on and there were people that just followed along. And now when people ask my wife, ask my wife, like, why, why doesn't she work at the university anymore? And she said, well, she was fired. And they say, why? I was like, well, because I didn't have a vaccine pass. And they're like, what, what was that? What are you talking about? They don't even remember that it happened. Okay. It's not even, it's not even in, they're like, oh yeah, something like that. Like they don't even remember it. So there, there's, there are the people that, that, you know, suffered at that, from that and that like we remember it and then there are the sheep <laughs> that were sheep back then and they are sheep now and you can't and and they will follow whatever whatever flow is happening right <clears throat> so it's our job as the non-sheep as the non-npcs 
to plug up with other non-NPCs who can see a little bit outside from a bird's eye view and say, it's the Fed. And then when there's enough of us, and whether, whether it results in us uh, waving pitchforks at the Fed and taking over the building, which I don't think it's going to happen, or it results in us saying, look, forget about the Fed, just keep stacking, make sure you're stacking, make sure he's stacking, make sure all the good, what we talk about all the time, like we, we can overthrow them that way and make sure that we have the power. But like, it's, we're not going to vote a, a, a benevolent dictator in, and we're not going to vote a philosopher king in. We're good. We all we can do is the best is the best we can do with our families and local communities, and 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 lead and lead as much as we can. And hopefully, we'll have the wherewithal, the economic wherewithal, and the intellectual wherewithal, and everything that we need to uh, turn the sheep around so that they completely forget about fiat currency, just like they completely forgot about COVID lockdowns, and they completely forget about. About uh, you know even even the MAGA the no, the anti MAGA people the Trump derangement people they're just another group of sheep and they're like oh if Trump's elected he's going to end democracy and he's not going to let any other president well what you know but what happened in 2016 did he allow another election yeah he did even though you could arguably say it was stolen I don't know if it was but even if it even if it was he he stepped down so why do you think he's going to do it but you say that and they're like oh I don't, they don't even respond to you so none of these people think the maga people the trump derangement people the, the we it's just up to us to turn them like the sheep they are into the right direction and and then use them to uh for good instead of evil i mean i don't i just don't see any other way you can't wake them up They're, forget about everything that you that all the intricacies of bitcoin how amazing blockchain is fine whatever but like you go back to the foundation it just doesn't make sense and and that's that but the people that think and they're like okay well we do have to progress from first principles and then build up but then the other people are like well what if what if we're thinking about it wrong. What if there's a step wrong in the logic and we can't, we just can't see it. And, and, you know, we have this whole thing, Bitcoin, and it's here at the right time. So like, why am I going to be distracted with petty logic, which might have something wrong in the, in the system that I can't see because, you know, am I going to trust my mind that deeply? No, I'm going to trust this blockchain thing. That's like so magnificent that that makes more sense. And then we're like, no, 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 the logic's right. And then like, okay, fine, but I'll deal with that later. Yeah. You'll deal with it when it crashes and you'll hopefully come back and join us. He proposes that the most effective way to influence change may not be through direct confrontation or dramatic actions, but through gradual, incremental efforts. By focusing on personal and community-level improvements such as financial stability and self-reliance, individuals can contribute to a broader transformation without relying solely on political or governmental interventions. A significant portion of Faber's discussion revolves around the Federal Reserve Fed and its role in the economic system. He suggests that the Fed's influence contributes to economic instability, which in turn affects societal stability. Faber advocates for financial independence and the importance of building personal and community resilience as a countermeasure to systemic economic problems. He argues that rather than trying to directly challenge or overthrow institutions like the Fed, individuals should focus on practical strategies for self-sufficiency. This includes investing in assets like Bitcoin and fostering local economic networks which can offer a degree of protection against broader financial instability. Faber draws on the concept of the butterfly effect to illustrate the potential impact of individual actions. He references a Jewish saying that saving one person can have far-reaching consequences, emphasizing the idea that positive change often starts on a small scale. By helping even a single person, one can potentially influence future generations and contribute to a larger wave of positive change. If you understand what's happening, first of all, and second of all, you can help one person. You know, there, there's a there's a Jewish saying: "Save one person, save the world," and that's uh, that's both literally true and emotionally true. Because if you do save one person, then who knows what kids that person's going to have? Who knows what line it's going to have? Who knows what kind of influence? You never know the influence, the positive influence that you're going to have uh, that one person can make, even insignificant person. You never know the negative influence that one person can have either. Um, it, it's all it's all butterfly effect stuff, you know. Uh, the flapping of the butterfly's wings can change anything in any direction in the entire planet. It's chaos theory. That's it's it's basically the Jewish equivalent of chaos theory. So what? Just why, tend your own garden and let it, uh, you know, deal with your neighbors and try and help. Yeah, them yeah. Them. Like you, this I, I heard this from from a, from a Chabad rabbi at towards the I guess the the peak of the COVID insanity. When I was really starting to lose it and um, and get depressed, and I was like, "What is this ever going to end? How do I deal with this?" 
And, uh, and, and he said to me, like the first, the first commandment is I am the Lord, your God, you know, uh, and meaning ergo, you're not like <laughs> I made the world and your job isn't to save the world. And it's my, it's my job to run the worldly business. And it's your job to tend to what your responsibility is and let the big things up to me. So uh, I had to, I had to go into that mentality or I was going to lose it. Cause like, I'm thinking like, okay, the world's the world is committing suicide. How do I save it? Because I know what's going on, but like, I can't, it's not my job. Um, so when you get to like these big world changing things, like assassination attempts, um, it's just take it as a signal that, okay, we're going in the direction of collapse. And uh, if the plane is already going down, you've got to get the, you know, your tray table up in the, uh, your, your tray table in the full upright position. And, uh, and your seat you fully forward up? or horrible yeah. things are going to happen, as Weird Al says. Yeah, turn your phone on airplane mode or the whole thing goes down. Then. Yeah, but so why specifically with inflation? Well, if you take, um, if inflation is the breakdown of trade, which is what it is, because you're trading with each other. Meanwhile, while every while the, the people on top are picking everybody's pocket simultaneously, um, you'll start to realize that the trade isn't really working. So if you have, if you, it, but if you have a more extreme example where there is no trade because like there, let's say all the most liquid commodities are just whisked off by aliens and nobody can trade anymore, then you'll have a complete breakdown of society where everybody's killing everybody. So when you, when you have what looks like a breakdown in society, but it's not a complete breakdown in society, which is what we're in now where it's, it's breaking down, we can see it, but there's still these vestiges of order that are still there. So I guess you could you could use the marginal utility argument, right? The marginal utility of each unit is what sets the price. So there is a marginal utility. There, there are the marginally insane people. And once you get to a certain amount of despair, then the people that are marginally insane, but they're marginally sane, they tip over into insanity. Kennedy, On the okay. fringe, they're the ones that go out and start shooting politicians. Faber reflects on the disillusionment many people feel towards the political system. He notes that political leaders, whether perceived as good or bad, often become scapegoats for broader societal issues. Faber suggests that instead of placing excessive faith in political solutions, individuals should focus on their own responsibilities and local communities. He recounts a personal anecdote about advice from a Chabad rabbi during the COVID-19 pandemic. The rabbi's counsel to focus on one's own duties and leave the larger problems to a higher power resonates with Faber's broader message of maintaining perspective and not becoming overwhelmed by global issues. Faber explores the potential for revolutionary change and the role of political figures like Donald Trump. He discusses the idea that extreme political scenarios might provoke significant societal reactions, potentially leading to a breakdown or transformation of the current system. Faber acknowledges that while Trump may be a less unfavorable option compared to other candidates, the focus should remain on addressing systemic issues rather than relying on any single leader to resolve them. Finally, Faber touches on the perceived futility of voting and the belief that political processes are ultimately controlled by forces beyond individual influence. He references George Carlin's famous quote about the nature of voting to illustrate his skepticism about its effectiveness in enacting real change. Faber's message is that while voting and political involvement are part of the process, they are not the sole or most significant factors in achieving meaningful societal change. I can't say I understand where MAGA is coming from, but I guess in my head, where they are coming from is that Kamala Harris is so terrifying and evil, um, and I see where they're coming from when they think that, that if Trump is not president, the entire country will self-destruct and we will all die in a pandemonium. Mad Max, a uh, thunderdome. Oh, Mad Max. Oh, okay. Mad Max. Yeah. yeah. They, they think that's going to, and they think, they think that electing Trump is so important right now that if you're going to waste your vote on a Ron Paul write-in, which is really, it's not going to accomplish anything practical, which that, that's true. It's not then you're abandoning the country in its time of utmost need. So my response to that is uh, there's two. Um, first of all, as I said to you uh, a day or two, maybe it was yesterday. I think I said it yesterday. We were texting. And I said, look, I Trump is obviously the, the better candidate or the less bad candidate on a simplistic level. Um, but we don't really know what would be better for the country um, and I think this is what Robert Wenzel, who I consider my economics teacher, he was the um, the late proprietor of Economic Policy Journal in 
targetliberty.com, those two blogs. And he said he he preferred Hillary to Trump because people hate Hillary a lot more with a lot more passion and it would create a lot of more anti-government sentiment that maybe there'd be a break and and like a, a you know a, an American Revolution 2.0. He, he's not the one to root for revolution or like on a, in a communist sense. And he understands that it's dangerous. And I, I understand that revolutions are very dangerous. I get it. Um, but what I think you were at the point in America where going in the direction that you're going is uh, could be as as dangerous or as risky as a straight up revolution would be at this point. I don't I'm not sure. So uh, Kamala, if she's re- elected, would be so hated that that states would maybe just secede on their own and. Um, we'd see what the federal government would do. Um, whereas Trump would unite whatever faith there is left in the government. And, uh, you know, that could be bad because Trump can take you in the wrong direction. For example, uh, certain uh, things in your arm or a lockdown or Fauci, he could, you know, pray yeah. in front of people. A lot of bad things can happen. So, uh, you know, voting, don't take voting so seriously. It doesn't really matter. It's not, we don't, it's, it's really up to God who leads countries. It's not up to man. Voting is just an exercise in futility. I'm convinced even here in Israel, there was a guy I liked Moshe Faglin. I still like him. Um, and I'll vote for him. Not that I think it'll do anything, but I don't, I don't think that when you die and you, and, and you, you're, you're facing God and he says, Phil, why didn't you vote for Trump in 2024? You're going to, I don't think that's going to be one of the questions. Okay. I don't think it matters. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's what, what George Caron say. It's like if voting mattered, they wouldn't let you do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. George, I wish he was, I, I'd love him to be president. Wow. <laughs> He'd be great. Yeah.